So first of all, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, my dear friends, Thanasis and uh, Andreas, it is a great pleasure for me to participate in this uh, uh, course. And uh, I'm very confident that it will be a big uh, success. So I was given the task to present on the EAU guidelines for the management of benign prostatic obstruction and what is the place of the prostate enucleation. I have no conflict of interest related to this presentation. So uh, we live in the era of evidence-based medicine. And that means that uh, if we want to offer high quality healthcare to our patients, we need to, uh, to have this uh, healthcare consistent with the best available evidence. And the best available evidence comes from uh, the analysis of uh, systematic uh, uh, reviews and meta-analysis of randomized control trials, pool data, and well-conducted randomized control trials. However, today I will not uh, focus only on the guidelines, but also on the position of enucleation exactly in the area of evidence-based medicine. But as clinicians, what we need from the guidelines is to have some good recommendations. That means recommendations that will indicate to us what to do to which specific subpopulation of patients under which specific circumstances. And this uh, recommendation should use a clear language, not words like may or consider or think. No, a clear language. And this recommendation should be implementable. And so we should also be able to measure the impact of this uh, recommendation in our daily practice. So when we develop recommendation and guideline, actually what we do is to evaluate the evidence. So we evaluate the quality of evidence, the benefit to harm ratio for our patients, the values and the preferences of the patients, and if it's possible, also the cost of the procedure. And on, when we take into account all this, then we can reach to a recommendation that is strong or weak, against or in favor of a specific a treatment or a specific test. So if you look at this algorithm developed by the EAU guidelines panel on mail ads, previously in the past, the surgical section of the guidelines was based on technology rather than the surgical approach. But in our daily practice, in clinical reality, it's primarily reflected by surgical approach and not necessarily by a specific technology. For this reason, we changed the guidelines. So the invasive section now has five subsections resection, enucleation, vaporization, alternative ablative techniques, and non-ablative techniques. And these are the, guide, the recommendations of the EAU guidelines for the enucleative techniques. So pay attention to the wording, but also uh, to the method that each one of these techniques is compared to. So if you look at the uh, open prostatectomy, is uh, indicated for men with big prostates in the absence of bipolar enucleation or HOLEP. If you look at the HOLEP, then we have a strong recommendation as an alternative of TURP and uh, open prostatectomy. And for the bipolar uh, endoscopic enucleation, we have a weak recommendation as an alternative to TURP. So for the diode laser, again, a weak recommendation as an alternative to bipolar to uh, enucleation or TURP or the, uh, or the HOLEP. For the Tulium Young, we have a strong recommendation as an alternative of TURP and HOLEP. Why? Because this is what the uh, studies indicate to us. The guidelines are based on the available studies. So we cannot have a big uh, gap in our knowledge. We should always base our recommendation on the available guidelines. For this reason, we don't have recommendation for laparoscopic or robotic simple prostatectomy or for the green light laser uh, enucleation because we don't have randomized controlled trials that are needed in order to uh, develop a recommendation. So why we need the enucleation? Obviously, we know from our daily pra practice that we have different subpopulation of patients. We have patients who are older uh, and they have some severe comorbidities. Usually they are under uh, antithrombotics and this can result in a long waiting list and also in prolonged hospitalization. But also we have patients who are very fit patients who want to have some durable results, and patients who are very much interested in preserving their circulation. And also we have patients with different characteristics, patients with big prostates, with small prostates, with different baseline characteristics. So always the eternal question is how much tissue we should resect. Should we completely remove the adenoma or a minimal TRP or a channel TRP is more than enough, and we have the extra bonus of the reduced morbidity. 
The problem is that we have some conflicting results uh, from the short-term uh, studies. But if you look at the long-term results, we know that the more tissue we reject, the more durable results we have. And we know that very well from the historic series of open prostatectomy. And also, as Andreas mentioned before, TRP has some severe limitations. For example, the upper lipid is between 80 to 100 cc. I know. It depends on the experience and the expertise of the surgeon. Correct. But when we talk about the average urologist, the average speed of resection is around 0.6 to 0.7 grams per minute. And that means that if we have to reject a big prostate, then we need to prolong our anesthesia time and our operation time. And then maybe we have a higher incidence of TUR syndrome. I know. In bipolar uh, uh, TURP era, we don't have TUR, TUR syndromes. But again, there is always the risk of fluid absorption for our patients. This is a very interesting study coming from Germany with more than 10,000 patients. And uh, this study shows that the larger the prostate, the higher the incidence of complication when we perform a TURP. This is another interesting concept. We know that all the different surgical procedures for the uh, management of benign prostatic obstruction have a different impact on PSA drop after the, the surgery. But we know very well that the inoculative techniques, open and endoscopic, have the most drastic uh, PSA drop. And uh, we can use this uh, PSA nadir as a proxy to evaluate the relief from the bladder outlet uh, obstruction because it is associated with a higher reduction in IAPSS and a higher increase in QMAX. And something that uh, sometimes we uh, disregard when we talk about with our patients that more than 50% of our patients still, they are still under treatment with uh, drugs after a surgical procedure. But uh, from the available surgical therapies, the laser uh, enucleation of the prostate seems to have the highest rate of medication discontinuation after surgery. What about sexual function? Now we have long-term data. So we have uh, data from at least five years, and you can see there is no significant difference in erectile function uh, between the surgical interventions and TURP in terms of de novo, erectile dysfunction, integrated ejaculation. And with all these new uh, ejaculation preservation techniques, uh, we can preserve the ejaculation in a significant number of our patients. Another big study coming from a large reimbursement database from Korea with almost 60,000 patients and a follow-up of five years. And what did they find? They found that the rate of reoperation was significantly higher in the TURP group compared with the HOLEP group. And in addition to that, patients who were treated with HOLEP had a lower percentage of uh, uh, need for uh, drug, uh, drug treatment after the procedure. What about the, uh, the anti patients who are receiving antiplatelets or anticoagulants? Again, I need to clarify from the very beginning that we cannot transfer directly the benefits of the laser vaporization to the laser enucleation. But again, the available studies show that the laser enucleation has better outcomes compared to TURP in terms of transfusion and bleeding. Again, there are some uh, significant limitations because these studies were retrospective in their nature, and also they have a high heterogeneity. So we have patients with um, a prostate volume between 50 and 100 uh, cc's, and also there was a big population with respect to what kind of uh, anticoagulants or antiplatelets they received. Also, if they stop it, or they continue under treatment, or they had the bridging with uh, low molecular uh, weight uh, heparin. So this was um, a rather provocative uh, article we wrote in the past, and we tried to direct to compare directly the different power sources in terms of functional results, incontinence, learning curves, subpopulation of patients who will benefit from uh, different uh, energy sources. And what we found, the conclusion was that there is no convincing data on the superiority of one energy source over the other at any uh, endpoint. And the anatomical endoscopic nucleation of the prostate can be safely and effectively performed use any technology without compromising post-operative post -operative outcomes. This is a very interesting um, systematic review of the learning camps, and uh, Vicent was part of this uh, project. And uh, I, I know that one of the main criticisms that the enucleation techniques have, uh, uh, has, uh, have received 
is the rather steep learning curve. So this is a very nice systematic review that evaluated all the studies on the learning curve. <laughs> Most of the studies are on HOLEP. So the learning curve for the HOLEP is between 30 to 50 cases. For the uh, green light enucleation, there is a huge variation from 20 to 150 to 200 cases. And for the endoscopic bipolar enucleation, then you can see that uh, you need rather 40 to 60 cases in order to achieve a level of experience or a level of competence. The main problem is the criteria we use to define this level of competence or level of experience. So our task is to find the uh, most precise criteria to define this level of experience. And if we want to do so, I think that we need to adopt the trifecta or pentafecta. Trifecta includes combination of complete enucleation and morselation within less than 90 minutes without any conversion to standard ERP. And pentafecta, we have two additional criteria. The absence of any postoperative complication and the absence of stress urinary incontinence at three months after the procedure in four consecutive patients. There are many patients, and, uh, sorry, there are many papers coming and uh, uh, one year after one year, and you can see that uh, indicate that uh, enucleation is a size independent method. And more, uh, more on this, some colleagues moved one step fur uh, further and they now uh, suggest whole as a treatment for patients with a, a prostate smaller than 30 cc's. So in conclusion, the academic concessions, consensus position the concept over the energy source. That means that it is the enucleation that makes the difference. Enucleation is enucleation, is enucleation, is enucleation, as Thomas Herman said. So the energy source has a secondary impact on the outcome of the enucleation. And it seems that it's uh, more or less related to the institutional resources and the personal preferences of the skilled and experienced surgeon. And with respect to the guidelines, guidelines do change because they depend on the available data. So if we have more studies, most probably the guidelines will change. The EU guidelines, I think is the best guidelines we have because they do an annual search, they update the content, and they also reevaluate the strength of recommendation based on the new studies. They have if you look at the algorithm, they have three decision points to assist us to select the right treatment. One, if the patient can receive anesthesia. One, if the second one, if the patient can stop the anticoagulants. And the third one is the prostate volume. But if you look very carefully at this algorithm, you can see that enucleation is almost everywhere in these boxes. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Gravas. It was uh, very important to see all these indications and uh, be sure what we are doing. Um, do you have any questions, please? So, no question for Professor Gravas. <laughs>